uh, an experiment of democracy now for nearly two and a half centuries. And we have been guided by a, a, a constitution and subsequent laws that support and sustain the common good as well as individual rights. And in order to maintain that, that balance, you and I have been entrusted with this remarkable freedom to select men and women who will defend our constitution by establishing and enforcing reasonable and enforceable laws. <clears throat> but I don't think it's any surprise to say that the common good appears kind of elusive at this moment in our national history. You've seen, if you've watched any of the news, that peaceful coexistence in our neighborhoods and towns and cities and states have kind of given way to some mistrust and antagonism and fear, and in some places have even threatened to derail or even extinguish our democratic way of life. So this is a crucial moment, we feel, for American Catholics to recall, or maybe to learn for the first time, that the church firmly believes that God has a vision for human society that supersedes governmental plans and policies. And ignorance of that plan somehow has become more obvious these days in places where self-preservation and I think even self-importance have supplanted the common good. So some of you have already cast your votes, I've learned, for this year's general election, and thank you for doing that. Others are still pondering their decision, but still in an effort to hand on to you our Catholic tradition, especially about the use of the vote as a mature moral Catholic, the staff and I have decided we'd like to spend some time tonight and on a couple of other opportunities in the weeks ahead to recall for you the Catholic perspective on some of the issues that are causing so much division among us, as well as to explain what the church means by having a well-formed conscience. None of what we have to say to you tonight is intended to coerce your vote for a specific candidate. Tonight's teaching is meant to help you make the best choice possible based on a fuller understanding of what the church teaches about making difficult decisions, even and especially when individual candidates don't necessarily represent every choice that we would deem to be right or honorable or even moral. So before I turn over the uh, podium to, to Matthew and to Felicia, let's for a moment pray. Holy Spirit, you are the source of all wisdom wisdom which we have acquired through our study, wisdom from the scriptures and our Catholic tradition, wisdom from the example of holy men and women you have put into our lives, and wisdom retrieved from our own reflection on our life's experience. As we prepare in the days and weeks ahead, to elect leadership for our country, free us from unnecessary and unproductive fear by preparing our hearts and minds for a deeper measure of your wisdom, by giving us a clearer vision of the common good you expect us to provide for all people, and by shaping our consciences to discern swiftly and decisively the choices that further your vision for the world rather than our own. We make this prayer in your power, Holy Spirit, who leads us through Christ to the glory of God, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. 
let me invite you as you listen to this presentation, uh, if you have questions or need to make uh, want some clarification, I'd invite you to put it right away into the chat box. Uh, we're going to use that as a, a space for further conversation, both in small groups for a short time and in a larger plenary conversation after we hear the presentation that Matt and Avery have to offer. So let me turn this over to them. Matt, you're muted. Thanks, Father Dan. So over the next few minutes, we'll quickly go over some of the issues raised by the US Catholic bishops in their teaching document, Forming Consciences for Faithful Citizenship. First published in 1995 and republished with updates in 2009, its purpose is to help Catholics in the US, not just citizens um, and not just those who are eligible to vote, but Catholics in the US, to identify the most important issues of our shared public life and to help us understand them in light of Catholic teaching. It's in three parts. Part one of the document is the bishop's reflection on the nature of faithful citizenship in the church, both for the clergy and the laity. Um, in shaping and participating uh, in public life. Part two is an overview of major policy issues and part three proposes future goals for political life, raising challenges for citizens, candidates, and um, public officials. In its pastoral constitution on the church in the modern world, the Second Vatican Council teaches that Catholics participation in civil society inscribes the divine law into public life and helps bring about the kingdom of God on earth. We Catholics must promote the common good above our own individual interests, and we must oppose evil. The political realities mean, however, that we're more often than not faced with a dilemma, as Father Dan alluded to. The US Catholic bishops acknowledge that there is no one right, right way of voting as a faithful Catholic in this country. Um, quote, we bishops do not intend to tell Catholics for whom or against whom to vote. Our purpose is to help Catholics form their consciences in accordance with God's truth. We acknowledge that the responsibility to make individual choices in political life rests with each individual in light of a properly formed conscience and that participation goes well beyond casting a vote in a particular election. We'll now go over a quick overview of all of the issues raised in part two of the document from the USCCB. All of them are lined up here nicely. So the bishops raised 13 issues which we can think of in as ways in which we can promote the common good and oppose evil, human life, peace, promotion of peace, marriage and family, religious freedom, preferential option for the poor, health care, migration, Catholic education, promoting justice and countering violence, combating unjust discrimination, care for our common home, communications, media and culture, and global solidarity. The dignity of human life is the central moral principle of our Catholic faith. It's, it's the principle from which all of the other sort of principles of Catholic social teaching and all the other sort of policy initiatives proposed uh, by the US bishops um, spring. The bishops first exhort us to oppose threats to human life. Abortion, euthanasia, assisted suicide, human cloning, the destruction of human embryos are, quote, always wrong, the bishops remind us. Laws that legitimize any of these practices the bishops teach us are profoundly unjust and immoral and therefore should be opposed. The bishops urge us to draw, excuse me, to support laws and programs that encourage childbirth, adoption, addressing poverty, providing health care, offering assistance to pregnant women, children and families, greater assistance to those who are sick and dying. Respect for human life and dignity is also the foundation for essential efforts to address and overcome hunger, disease, poverty, and violence. We should also remember that in 2018, the church declared, quote, the death penalty inadmissible. 
and that Catholics should work for its abolition worldwide. The death penalty has always been an objective evil, which in the past could be legitimately tolerated in pursuit of the common good. Consequently, its inadmissibility now is not a change to the church's teaching on the death penalty itself, but rather an acknowledgement that the realities of the present world are such that this final penalty can no longer be legitimately imposed. The dignity of human life also compels us to work to avoid war and promote peace. Catholics must oppose policies and laws that enable genocide, torture, direct and intentional targeting of non-combatants in war and terrorism. Weapons of mass destruction are fundamentally immoral. These affronts to human life may occur far from our neighborhoods, but they are always wrong. The U.S. should always work to reverse the spread of nuclear, chemical, and biological weapons and to end global arms trade. While the Catholic tradition recognizes the legitimacy of war, what teaches when defending the innocent in the face of grave evil, we must not lose sight of the cost of war and its harm on human life. Nations have the right and obligation to defend human life and the common good against terrorism, aggression, and similar threats, such as targeting of persons for religious persecution, including Christians. Pope Francis recently observed that there are more martyrs in the church today than there were in the first centuries. Catholics should support policies and actions to protect refugees of war and violence and all those suffering religious persecution are to be supported. Promoting family life, economic justice, and the poor likewise spring from the principle of the dignity of human life. The bishops affirm that, quote, the family founded upon marriage as the basic cell of humanity must be supported. This teaching reminds us that we are not, the fir we, that we are not first and foremost individuals looking out for our own good, but rather connected through relationships and so charged to look out for the common good. The Catholic tradition affirms marriage as a lifelong exclusive commitment between a man and a woman, and as the source of the next generation and the protective haven for children. The church also teaches that, quote, the reciprocity between male and female is an expression of the beauty of nature willed by the creator, unquote, and that sexual difference in the complementarity of the sexes is something quote, more than a social construct or psychological reality, which a person may choose at variance with his or her biological reality. This affirmation in no way compromises the church's opposition to unjust discrimination. <clears throat> Catholics should support policies um, on wages, taxes, work, divorce, immigration, and welfare that uphold the God-given meaning and value of marriage and the family that help families stay together and that help workers support their families. Public assistance should be available, especially to help poor families to live in dignity. Religious freedom is defined as having immunity from coercion on the part of individuals or of social groups so that no one is forced to act in a manner contrary to his own beliefs, whether privately or publicly, whether alone or in association with others. The Catholic tradition affirms the freedom of each person's conscience, even as it affirms the objective truth of its moral teaching. Catholics should promote religious liberty vigorously, both at home and abroad for all religious groups, Christian and non-Christian alike. A preferential option for the poor and the promotion of economic justice is a core principle of Catholic social teaching, springing again, of course, from the uh, respect for the dignity of human life. Wages should allow workers to support their families and public assistance, such as tax credits, social security, food stamps, and other welfare programs must be available to help poor families to live in dignity. Catholics should support <clears throat> policies that foster creation of jobs with deep, decent working conditions and fair wages. 
discrimination in pay and employment should be overcome. We should be committed to supplying safe, affordable and quality housing and improve existing housing. Faith-based groups should be recognized and supported as effective partners in, uh, to the government in the poorest areas and their religious freedom should be protected as they work with the government. Food security should be a first priority for agricultural policy. Farmers and farm workers should have safe working conditions and adequate housing. Affordable and accessible health care is an essential safeguard of human life and a fundamental human right. The nation's health care system needs to meet the me needs of the poor and uninsured, especially born and unborn children, pregnant women, immigrants, and other vulnerable populations. The USCCB supports measures to strengthen Medicare and Medicaid. The bishops already in 1995 and again in, in 2009 emphasized as a core policy issue that, um, that Catholics in the US need to be aware of as migration. They write, quote, the gospel mandate to welcome the stranger requires Catholics to care for and stand with newcomers, authorized and unauthorized, including unaccompanied immigrant children, refugees and asylum seekers, those unnecessarily detained and victims of human trafficking. Trafficking victims, most especially children, should receive care and protection, including special consideration for permanent legal status." Unquote. The bishops also identify a growing culture of violence that Catholics must oppose and work to end. We must do this by promoting moral responsibility in our local communities, responding to violent crime, supporting reasonable restrictions on access to assault weapons and handguns, opposing the use of the death penalty, and working toward a reform of our criminal justice system by reframing our attitudes on justice around responsibility, rehabilitation, restoration, and reintegration, rather than revenge and punishment. The bishops also affirm that Catholics must stand with all oppressed persons and oppose unjust discrimination on the basis of race, religion, sex, ethnicity, disabling condition, or age. Global climate change is a moral issue. The Holy Father's 2015 encyclical letter Laudato Si reminds us that, quote, to commit a crime against the natural world is a sin against ourselves and a sin against God." Unquote. Pope Francis challenged us to see just how inseparable the bond is between the concern for nature, justice for the poor, commitment to society, and interior peace. The U.S. bishops affirm that we must seriously address global climate change, focusing on the virtue of prudence, pursuit of the common good, and the impact on the poor, particularly on vulnerable workers and the poorest nations, and that the U.S. should lead the world in contributing to the sustainable development of poorer nations. And this leads us to a final point emphasized by the bishops. Solidarity is a firm and persevering determination to commit oneself to the common good. It is a virtue that leads to true charity. In order to address the scandal of global, po global poverty and underdevelopment, Catholics in the U.S. must support basic human rights, promote global religious li liberty, especially by promoting the defending and defending the rights of religious minorities, providing political and financial support for international bodies and international law, and support the provisions of asylum to refugees. Most of these objectives are outside the scope of any one person's ability to act directly. Instead, Catholics are called to hold their elected officials accountable to these values and to promote them within their own communities. In the conclusion of their document, the bishops remind us that not all issues are equal. 
these goals address matters of different moral weight and urgency. Some involve intrinsically evil acts, which can never be approved. Others involve affirmative obligations to seek the common good. We weigh these issues and we decide which evils to oppose or to tolerate, even if we don't condone them, and which goods to pursue, even at the expense of not being able to pursue other goods. We weigh all these issues according to our consciences, which we have a duty to inform in light of church teaching. Father Dan, you're muted. Oh, you're muted, Father Dan. Father, you're muted. Father Dan. Thank you. Um, here's what I'd like to suggest for the next few minutes. Um, there are three of us that are leaders. There are 15 of us here gathered. Um, I'd like to suggest we break up for a moment. And here are three things that I'd like you to sort of think about, or at least to begin a conversation. The first is, did anything of what you heard surprise you? A second one would be, do you have any deep disagreement about any of these particular issues presented by the National Conference? And probably the, 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 the most significant one is, um, have you ever thought about or have you ever prioritized these in a way that you can address them in your own life? That's a big one. But I'd like to let you just kind of chew on those in smaller groups, and then I'll ask a few more um, pointed questions, but also if there's other things that emerge from the chat box for our conversation, our larger conversation together. So does that make any sense? The first thing, any surprises, any disagreements, how have you prioritized these? Maybe I'll just put that those words into the chat just so that you can uh, have them in front of you. Surprises, disagreements, priorities for your life. And I'll, I guess Avery's going to divide us up. Thanks, Avery. Hello. Hello. Wait, hold on. I can't see your faces. Oh, oh. no, baby. <laughs> hey, Dominic. So cute. Matt, are we all supposed to be in the same room? Do you want... <laughs> no, I'm going to leave. <laughs> Get Father Dan in here, too. How are you guys? Oh, Annalise, I just saw your message. So we're just going over right now. We went over the 13 issues that the bishops. Oh no, it's not letting me minimize. I don't know why. Okay, hold on. I'll, I'll message you the issues so you can just have them in front of you as we talk over them. But basically the questions were, did anything surprise you as we went over the issues? Do you have any disagreements? And have you ever prioritized these in such a way that you can address them in your own life? And I'll try to get you the issues. Thanks, yeah, it'd be great if you could send me that info because I only caught the very last slide. Yeah, yeah. I'll try and copy and paste. So in the meantime, does anyone have any reactions? Um, I could say something about, I guess, um, as far as the first question, I didn't really have any major surprises because, um, so one, I've like read through this, um, like forming consciences document before. Um, like obviously mm -hmm. I haven't, I haven't really read the whole thing like cover to cover cause I think it's like something like 50 pages, but I scanned through it. And I think, um, when I first like turned old enough to vote and during the first election I could vote in, which was like last year's, uh, or, mm -hmm. like, um, uh, senatorial races and stuff like not a uh -huh. election um I like I don't know I'd always found the intersection of faith and sort of 
active citizenship to be very interesting, especially in like uh, a country like the US where, you know, religious freedom is such an, 